Welcome to another edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Born and educated in Los Angeles, California, Dr. William Bronson received his MD at the University of Southern California School of Medicine, completed his internship in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and was a resident in psychiatry at Menninger School of Psychiatry in Topeka, Kansas. But today, this is the second time that we've had Dr. Bronston on, but today we have a special subject to discuss. Single payer, our healthcare system, and much, much more. Folks, we have to realize that these are some serious times. But before we get any further, welcome to Politics and Right, Dr. William Bronson. How are you doing today? What a wonderful honor to be with you, my dear brother. Thank you well, very much. Well, look, let me tell you, it's always great speaking to you. Um, first of all, what has happened since the last time We've spoken. I think that's probably over a year ago or so. Jeez, you know, I've I've had a lot of interviews and uh, and I've been struggling to try and penetrate the community of single payer activists in the in the country. Uh, not successfully yet. The reason is that you know the healthcare system in our society touches every millimeter of our lives. I mean, there's no area where health is not somehow an issue. And in our society, the, the medical market system, the wealth transfer system that we refer to as a healthcare system, essentially is controlled by these gigantic cartels, the, uh, the um, uh, pharmaceutical cartels, the insurance industry, the uh, the hospital industry, the medical equipment industry, and and to try and change people's thinking about what single payer has meant for the people that have been working on it for the last sixty years, sixty years is very very challenging. People have not stopped in the last six decades to really reinvent to imagine what a transformed system would look and feel like and what had to be done to transform the culture and the society and the psychology of the universe of the mass of the population of the United States in that endeavor. That's okay. why it's, yeah. Let me, let me, let me stop you there because what I want, I want you to do is to, uh, so that we can, first of all, I, I'd like this to be for two audiences. One the activists within the single payer movement, which you said you may have some difficulty penetrating, and then the audience at large, the ones the who the masses, the ones who are scared yeah. of anything that sounds they don't like what they have, but they don't know what something else is. I understand. So I let's understand. let's start with where do you see single payer as it is today and its flaws? Well, there are some things that need to be done to encourage, comfort, secure the mass. And I'm absolutely clear that we must mobilize millions of people because it's going to require a direct vote in America, whether we're talking about a state single payer model or a national single payer model. The people are going to have to rise up in their own interest. So the need to have where there are organized, ordinary working class people and connect with them is critical. The trade union movement, the religious community, the church community, the advocacy community, uh, a poor people's campaign, on and on, move on, all of that. And the, the issues that I think would inspire and transform the mass to understand the benefits to them include things like, number one, ending all medical debt. Everybody is sitting here with billions of dollars of debt that we could buy out roughly at a dollar per thousand or even more than that. We know, I know that for sure. And so that has to happen. We need to fundamentally look at the enormous amount of savings, investments, and prosperity that would come with a universal single payer rightful system for the masses. We need to look at 
the whole issue of organizing neighborhood assemblies, which every county in, in the United States has neighborhood assemblies that are legitimate groups that need to be pulled out, organized into networks and connected to their local public health officers in their counties in order to monitor, to plan, to essentially prioritize and to report to the general population. There needs to be a conversation in the general public that doesn't exist yet. People are very uh, isolated from one another. And the whole campaign, the political campaign to communitize, to popularize the idea of well-being, well-being, not wellness, well-being as a general phenomenon, as an experience cultural experience in the population is a crucial discussion that has to be articulated, proper language, and proper approach to the general population through programs like yours and others that reaching, you know, tens of thousands and millions of folks to think about, to think about the benefits that would happen. I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, and I, I think I am, I, I think you're in, for implying that Whereas the single payer movement right now is sort of a bit middle heavy. I don't want to say top heavy, but middle heavy in the folks who know the concepts and et cetera. You're saying it's likely stagnating because you don't have the uplift from the people. And the only way to get that is to create is to really start much of what some of us believe in grassroots movement on the county level on the precinct level by showing interest, having mass movement in all these groups. And I see a carrot in what you just mentioned. You talk about medical debt. Right now, uh, there's a hell of a lot of medical debt on the books of the plutocrats that are there to take your money. They, they know that most of that money they're not gonna get, but they keep it on the books so that when you die, maybe they get your house. When you die, Maybe they'll get everything that's left. How, what's the buy-in for the American citizen? Hey, they, they've pretty much taken a lot from us already. Let's start talking about buying this debt off, clearing the slate, and then that is a buy-in for a large percentage of Americans, clearing that debt, that undeserved debt, and moving forward from their carrots, grassroots, movement if i did, did i get that correctly from Absolutely your narrative right. so you know your friend jerry ashton who yes. has been working on rip medical yes. and veteran debt and and jerry really you know is is a hammer in terms of eliminating debt people can't imagine being relieved of tens of thousands of dollars of debt medical debt now there's another area that we can relieve as well and that is student debt. Right. So I believe that in order to transform the workforce, to get away from what we currently have and reach a, a, a much more congenial, a much more compassionate, a much more politically devoted uh, community of health workers, we need to buy out the tuition at the post-secondary level of every health care professional trainee in exchange year for year for assignment to an underserved area that would be engineered through something like a California Health Corps or, or a National American Health Corps so that we can build comprehensivity at the local level so people can see and feel the services of caring at the local level in your home and in your neighborhood. And so we know, I, I, I spent last week at a wonderful meeting in Modesto where the state uh, director of public health was there and every single public health officer in the state of California was there. There was 61 uh, public health, 61 county, 61 officers there. We need to build a partnership between the neighborhood assembly leadership and the local public health officers in order to build that campaign and that momentum and to determine where we need to put doctors, nurses, dentists, social workers, uh, psychologists, uh, med tech people. I met yesterday, I, I fell down the other day and I had to go for an x-ray and 
the, the, the young man, a uh, Hispanic young kid that uh, did the x-ray is in debt for $50,000 to become a licensed x-ray technician. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. He shouldn't have to pay a penny for that education because what he's doing essentially is serving the, the community. So, you know, I, and, and he doesn't have a clue about the old idea of single payer or the possibility of not having to pay that onerous amount of money. And you look, look at what, what, what medical students have to pay and nursing students have to pay and dental students have to pay that forces them into being carnivorous, into being uh, uh, charging people and, and needing high amounts of money. And then all of that is only one third of all that is, is escalated by the middlemen, by, by the bureaucrats that are, that are pulling a third of all the dollars that are, should be allocated to caring for ourselves into their pockets. So if we eliminate medical debt, if we eliminate student debt, and we exchange that student debt for service year for year, if you go to medical school for four years, you got to be assigned somewhere into an urban or a rural health desert of which the country is laden with because of the lack of adequate money driven by the current system to draw people in to provide services. So there's huge areas that don't have an obstetrician, huge areas that don't have a psychiatrist, huge areas that don't have proper dental care, neonatal services, and so forth. I mean, it just, it just goes on and on and on. We need to fill those empty places with with students, graduate students, healthcare students, whose tuition we've paid, who are not in debt, and who will live and stay in those communities and likely stay there, even though they wouldn't necessarily choose to go to a poor area or an underserved area out of, out of you know, their initial, you know, looking for a place to, to start a business. We have to end the business aspect of medical services and transform our profit-driven system to a nonprofit system. These are complicated challenges, Egberto, extremely complicated, and they require public consciousness. They require an understanding on the part of the mass of people that there is something transformative and comforting and securifying that could be developed if we had a adequate campaign and if people understood in the conversation the need for this radical revolutionary transformation in our culture. People have to have a feeling of caring for one another, different from what we experience right now, where I, there's a lot of competition and isolation. I don't, Bill, let me just say, I don't, William, I don't see it as, no. yeah, I, I, I don't see it as complicated in as much as we have to get that information understood and i now that you've explained that further i think we it almost seems like a three-prong approach one education on the grassroots uh level about one single payer is and and getting it politically devised meaning in the political ethos but that can only be done through these uh, uh these educational processes in every single precinct in our country two we also have to talk about uh, 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 th that we have to move from uh, this system to a new. But within this current system, there's a whole lot of debt. There's a way that we relieve the debt, dollar on the, dollar on the thousand or something of that nature, but we get those things written off of the books. And three, the mobilization of healthcare workers through the forgiveness of student loans. I think that is a great, uh, a, not only a great selling point, a great wake up, given that people have such, such a small, a short attention span right now because of all the other things that they have to do. Medical debt relief, a student loan for medical folks, I think it's a great way to get the attention of a large percentage of the population. I agree. Right and it's not being talked about in the single payer movement. There are right. two other areas that are really profound. One of them is to establish the public health system at the top of the pyramid of administration of whatever we, we ultimately have. The public health system has been unfunded from 1980, and it's only beginning to regather its footing. 
but we need to not have doctors that are dealing with individual illness. We need to have MPH, uh, masters in public health, doctors in public health, MD, MPH professionals trained and experienced at the top of the system so that we're looking at population health, prevention, early intervention, and getting at the root cause of disease and, and, and the problems that, of suffering that people are experiencing. Secondly, we need fundamentally to build a, uh, a, a major area that looks at linking the VA and the Indian Health Service and the Federal Quality Medical Center system, which are all independent massive systems that are population-based services into a single system where we have one way of putting all the money in one bank account in order to pay all the bills. Nobody would pay a penny at the point of service and the entire system would be funded by tax money for which we already have more than 80% in the bank today to provide Cadillac quality services, one tier of care for everybody in the society. I think that that is something for many uh, people find hard to understand. Yeah. The only reason we have a tiered system is because we are not only a tiered system, the only reason we claim healthcare is so expensive in the United States is because of the for-profit motive. And if you take a look at what every layer makes, the insurance companies, the drug companies, all these folks that are actually dependent on public services, the drug companies, a large percentage of their invention designs, et cetera, comes from the public sector, universities, et cetera. When it comes to the, to the manufacture of equipment for your, your a new leg or whatever, a lot of these inventions had its genesis in the, in public, in the public sector yet, they don't get a piece of the action. We funded have to understand taxes. funded That's by right. taxes. We have to understand that. And, and once we lay that out, we make the case for, because a lot of people have a tendency to say, well, somehow the private sector does things better than the uh, public sector. That, that is a figment of their imagination. That is simply, whenever the public sector fails, it's because the private sector enters and, and either purposefully makes it fails or the for profit motive makes it less efficient. And we have the few data. Get it. We absolutely have the data to, yes. to demonstrate that. Yes. The other thing that has to happen that really is radical is we need to end long term care as it currently is funded by Medicaid, which is the whole thrust of my book, Public Hostage, Public Ransom ending institutional America. We need to replace long-term care with lifetime care, right? which, which we have in the disability community in, in America, we have individualized planning for kids in education, for grownups in vocational services, and for people with developmental disabilities or, or uh, I, IDA problems in the general community through the regional center system. But we've never expanded that individual planning strategy to 100% of the population, which we could do to deflect people as they age from congregate segregated institutional terminus. Lifetime care planning in order to keep people in multi-generational community-based environments locally. And we need to fund the 41 million unfunded people that are taking care of some dependent member of their family in America by default, because the system, you know, relies upon that massive voluntary, involuntary pressure in order for folks that have special needs to be properly cared for and empowered yeah. in our society. These, these things are all possible. And, and the thing about it is, how do we define it and how we do we prevent ourselves from being co-opted by those who feel themselves the stakeholders that would actually lose stakeholders that don't deserve to be stakeholders etc and that i always see that as the biggest problem uh, the ideas are great executing the ideas great uh we we 
always get that influence from those who will then come in to try to muck it up, if you will. And one of the things that I think uh, we as a as activists can do is in the long run to defeat that sort of a input to make sure we have the numbers, make sure we have the numbers and make sure that we uh, that we are diligent in the way we're doing things. We're coming close to the end of the conversation, Doc, and I want to ask you to sort of summarize for me, how do we package this for the several pieces of the single pair movement such that they can see that only through uh, these three things that we spoke about, making it completely uh, grassroots and completely all encompassing, uh, can we get this done? First of all, everything that I've talked to you about is in detailed writing in my website, which is called ourhealth.pub.public, ourhealth.public. And if people go there, it's broken down into lots of different pieces, very interactive, where people can read and think about what it is that we're talking about here. The second thing is, we need to make our focus and effort on mobilizing youth to take the leadership here. We need to be providing input into high school kids and into post-secondary young people in order to talk about their future as the solution here. And I, I believe that, that we have existing structures like the American Public Health Association. The Public Health Association is the largest health professional organization in the country. They need to stand up on their soapbox and they need to hammer and trumpet the need for their leadership in a transformed healthcare delivery system. The structures are, the, the, in, the, the embryonic structures are already in America we need to somehow juice them. We need to encourage them. We need to recruit them. We need to empower them in order to, to pursue this moral imperative that we cannot surrender. It is What happens is that people feel defeated and depressed that they don't have the power to look at and change the system. And that cannot be allowed to prevail. People have to understand that if we don't change this healthcare system, we're headed for a totalitarian, anti-democratic, death-making culture and economy, which is what we're living in right now that everybody experiences and understands, but feels that they don't have the power to swing the bat to change the system. Folks, imagine having one card mm. and whenever you get sick, you go to a doctor, you never have to present a payment. You never have to present a, a anything but that card. Exactly. That card, <laughs> health security. And whether you need medicine, whether you need surgery, whether you need to be hospitalized, that's the only thing presented, that card. And society, all of us pay for and all of us benefit from. It is Dr. William Bronston. Thank you for enlightening thank you for pushing thank you for all that you do uh we will make sure in our lifetime to get this stuff started in our lifetime in for our sure. <laughs> in our lifetime all right thank have you have so a gander with the book have a gander with the book and have a gander with the website thank you so kindly thank you sir we spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.